Copycat Florida Invasive Exotic Plants. Welcome to another Garden Chat webisode. I'm Mark Itelli, Couple of Fern President. And today with me are team members Gia uh, Lee Ectel, Jennifer Hopton, the Lobos, and Kaylee Adams. We're celebrating Couple of Fern's 10 year anniversary with another free outreach. If you love what we do, please consider donating to our little nonprofit, as every little bit helps. If you happen to be in the region and we serve, we would love for you to become a couple of firm members as well. Simply visit fnps.org and join. We stay active throughout the year and membership happens to be the ultimate show of your love and support. Today's presentation covers copycat exotic invasive plants here in Florida that cause great environmental woes in our natural areas and can be tricky to identify to the untrained eye. We hope these slides help you quickly identify and report pest plants to land managers and stakeholders who can quickly address emerging invasions. So let me quickly introduce my uh, team members here, Jennifer Hopton Villalobos. She is our Hi. couplet fern invasive plant removal coordinator. She also happens to be uh, a city of Lake Helen, uh, which is named after Lake Helen. Uh, she is a restoration activist out there. Uh, matter of fact, we're planning to uh, organize and coordinate with her another round of native plants to help restore Lake Helen to what it historically used to be. Uh, Gia Lee Ecto is a, our couple of fern plant propagation coordinator. Um, she also happens to be the creator and admin and moderator of the ever popular Florida Native Gardening Group. It now boasts over 7,000 members and has over 30 posts per day. Uh, it is an excellent, excellent group in case you are inclined towards social learning where you learn from other people's pictures and captions and comments and that's how you learn. Uh, whether you have a native or non-native plant or worse, an exotic invasive that is causing problems in your local region. Kaylee Adams happens to be Couple of Ferns Children and Family Activities Coordinator. Uh, she also happens to be uh, the Native Gardening Group's moderator. Um, she is also a Seminole Rural Boundary Environmental Preservationist. So you'll see a lot of Kaylee if you're out in the uh, rural areas of Seminole County. Uh, she likes to pull over on the roadside and assess different plants. Matter of fact, that is one way that she found out uh, that we have a population of an endangered milkweed, Asclepius curtisii. Uh, I wanted to also especially thank FIS, which is the Florida Invasive Species uh, Partnership, CISMA, which is the Cooperative for Invasive Species Management. Uh, I believe the A stands for Association, University of Florida, and the University of South Florida, as well as other educational institutions uh, without their guidance and their publications and pictures. Uh, this presentation would not be what it is now. So special thanks to them. Uh, let's jump right in. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on these slides because we covered them before, but this is just a recap. Uh, general determination of a Florida native plant is uh, it is prior to European contact. It is found in the state. It is usually understood as indigenous and happens to exist prior to significant human impacts and alterations of the landscape. Uh, more information on this definition can be found on fmps.org. How do we define what we see as native, non-native, introduced, established, invasive? This is a great infographics uh, put together by FISP, and it shows that natives are the ones that are usually found before European contact. Non-native plants doesn't mean that they're naughty. It just means that they were uh, intentionally or unintentionally brought here by new humans but are not uh, escaping out into the wild. Established and invasive is once you begin to see an emerging problem. So species that are having self-sustaining and reproducing populations without human intervention uh, shows that it's established and invasive is when it is causing harm to the environment, the economy, and to the overall human well-being. So invasive is the worst uh, category of a non-native plant. 
Um, invasive plants is another great infographic. They get their edge from many different characteristics. They're tolerant of a wide range of environmental factors. Matter of fact, today's presentation on copycat invasives really highlights that some of these copycats can tolerate a wide range of different niches in our environment. And that's what uh, is the key to their success. They have rapid growth rates. They're highly efficient in producing lots of seed, lots of prolific seed, viable seed. And they also have something called allelopathy, which is chemical compounds that inhibit the growth and reproduction of other plants around them. So they limit the thrivability of other plants in their immediate vicinity. Uh, and here's another imp important infographic. Uh, we will be quoting a lot about uh, FLEP C, which is also known as Florida Exotic Pest Plant Council. So category one plants are usually displaced native species. They're changing ecological functions. Category two plants are the same as category one, but they're not altered yet so dramatically as category one plants have. So it's almost like a graduation method. So if you are on the Flepsy list, you're definitely on the naughty list. But if you happen to be on the Florida noxious weed list, the aquatic prohibited plant list, or the federal noxious weed list, that's synonymous with plant prison. So you have uh, graduated to such a bad level, uh, this particular plant, some of them happen to be Brazilian pepper, or we can have uh, water hyacinth. Those are ones that uh, it is unlawful to introduce, multiply, possess, move, or release any of those plants. So they have graduated to the worst list possible. So just because they're not, uh, you know, they're a non-regulatory list like FLEPC or the IFAS assessment doesn't mean that they are, uh, you know, non-problematic. They are problematic. They just haven't graduated to what we call plant prison. Um, so report your copycat invasives. The best uh, wet method is the partnership with the University of Florida, as well as uh, an organization called Bugwood, which is run by the University of Georgia. And they've come up with an app called I've Got One. So if you have an Android like me and you're trying to da download this, you'll see that it is made by somebody called Bub Bugwood, and that actually happens to be a subsidiary of the University of Georgia. There's a great way to report your non-invasive, I'm sorry, your non-native plants. If you're all apped out and you don't want another app on your phone, you can go on the website. It's I've got one.org, um, which will make you register. So you'll need to create a new username or an account with them if you are new there. Or you can just pick up the phone uh, and uh, dial 188-I've-got-one. And I've got one, just as you see in the picture on the iPhone right here, it's not just plants, but you can also report exotic invasive animals like, uh, for example, this Burmese python. Uh, and you can get some information on uh, you know, their invasive capabilities as well as a map of where, where they have been documented as being. So let's move on to um, the uh, section with Kaylee. Kaylee is here and she's going to touch on blue mist flowers. So Kaylee, if you'd like to go ahead and introduce yourself and take over. All right. Thank you. Uh, hi, I'm Kaylee. I help moderate in the uh, Florida Native Gardening Group that Gia created. And uh, when we started talking about this uh, live video immediately I thought about blue mist flower because it came up before and we had a really good discussion in the comments um, between Rufino or so uh, Osario I'm sorry and uh, Ryan Bear and uh, they helped describe differences that I was able to take the notes from and you can see them here is that um, with uh, the native blue mist flower which is conoclinium uh, colesta I'm sorry help me with that last one there Conoclinum celestinum. Okay. Don't ever ask anybody to spell it. They will fail. My goodness. I can't even pronounce it. Uh, so um, what they pointed out is that the leaves in the, or the stems and like the apices of the uh, leaves where it meets the stem uh, have a reddish tinge to it. And they have uh, less obvious kind of hairs that are, you know, kind of glands on the stem. 
and uh, they don't grow very shaggy or anything like uh, we'll touch on the invasives grow, you know, very messy looking. Um, they're also not as strongly serrated as the invasive counterparts. Um, and uh, like around the tip and the, where the uh, stem meets, uh, they can have reddish tinging there is uh, according to the discussion that we had there. Um, and uh, they come to a point, and from what I learned is that they're actually uh, facultative, is that they can grow in wet or dry sites. I thought that was interesting. Not many, you know, are adapted for doing that so well. Um, it's also in the uh, Asteraceae family, just like the uh, uh, invasive ones that we're going to look at. They're in the same family, except for Praxalis. Uh, that one's in a Praxalexis. I don't know how to pronounce that one either. Uh, but yeah, that's in a different family. But um, so these are the notes on the, the native one. And then the next slide will go into some of the uh, copycats. These guys. So uh, Agaratum histonium is known as blue mink uh, or floss flower. And uh, Agaratum or Agaratum conizoides. Please help uh, me on that one. Conozoides, Argyratum, Conozoides. Argyratum, okay. See, I, I told you I would butcher these. Uh, that yeah. one is a tropical whiteweed. And then the Praxalis there, uh, Praxalis clematidiae. Uh, that one. Praxalis. Praxalis. Okay, <laughs> Praxalis. Uh, that one, I didn't find any common names, so I, I'm just going to go with Praxalis on that one. And uh, I lumped these two together uh, because in the discussion we had on the uh, thread in the group, um, Rufino and Ryan both pointed out uh, that they're very similar in the structure of the leaf shape with, or, or the leaf shape and also with um, the, the prominent hairs on the stems. Um, so I grouped them together and uh, they're found in kind of similar areas also, but you can kind of see some difference in like the, the leaf color and the flower color on those ones. Um, they are originated both from Central America and they are not listed as invasive that I could find, but they seem to have invasive tendencies. So I wanted to add them in there. Um, they're usually found in citrus groves, nurseries and disturbed sites, fire lines, uh, things of that nature. And uh, the defining characteristics of these, as they said, especially uh, with these ones, the crushed leaves smell like uh, cat pee. So you don't want to go and testing that out unless you can stomach that. Um, but so I included some pictures that we had from the discussion. Um, the two top left pictures were from the group. Um, one was by a member. That's the one that has the little green bee on it. And then the top left was actually Gia's plant that Ryan pointed out as being the agaratum. Um, and so I, I added the other pictures. Um, on the bottom, that one is the conozoides. And the leaf shape looks very similar, I think. Uh, so it's very confusing to me to be able to see those two apart. So I found it difficult to create two different slides for them. Um, they both have, you know, serrated leaves and uh, shaggy growth, smelly. So it's, they're very similar. And then we have the Praxellus, which is uh, kind of found in a different area than those ones are. It's in central Florida mostly. It is listed as a category two, but it's not uh, federally prohibited. Um, it can grow as an annual or perennial and it's shaggy growth. Um, very similar also to Praxellus or, or Agaratum, that one. Um, and it can grow, it looks like, in, uh, uh, you know, rocks and concrete that I added there on the, the side there. Is That's a pretty, pretty weedy nature to be able to do that. And then next. Okay. I think the, we, were, we went one more. 
yes, with the praxalis there is the the leaves and the stems are not usually tinted with any red or maroon, uh, as Ryan and Rufino told us. And uh, they also have prominent hairs on the stems. And the leaf shape is different from the agaratums. It's kind of longer, still serrated, but not as sharply. Um, but they also smell bad, just like the agaratum. And then I have here, I put in as camphor trees, uh, cinnamon, cinnamomum camphora. Uh, it came from Asia. It was a very popular landscaping plant. And now it's a category one, but it's not federally prohibited. I think it should be. Um, it's very aggressive and it hosts a fungus that can affect the red bays, silk bays, and all of the laurel trees. Uh, plants that we have native to Florida, it causes a blight that kills them all, or laurel wilt, um, where you'll see half of the tree or one branch just turns completely dead and then following the whole tree. So it's pretty bad. So there we have on the left there is uh, Persia Bourbonia, that's the red bay, and then Prunus Caroliniana, I hope I said that right, uh, that's the cher cherry laurel tree. And then on the right there is the camphor tree. Uh, they all have berries that look similar, but the leaves all differ. The berries look different if you really look closely at them. Uh, yeah. But yes, Carolinia and the camphor are very comparable. That's really tricky. Mm -hmm. You have to really look at the uh, the end of the leaf shape there. Yeah. Like with uh, the camphor, it has that more of a tip to it. Yeah. Yeah, so that one gets me a lot because I have a camphor tree in my yard and I have red bays everywhere. So it's like, which are you? Got to figure it out. We Zip have prunia, but I always get mulch from different places and the camphor comes in mulch when you mm -hmm. get it from a store. Oh, yeah. It suckers out. You get If you get one, you get a million. Yeah. They're bad. Yeah. I usually uh, just go up to the tree and take a leaf off and smell it. If it smells like... Vicks Vapor up, like you have quoted, then we have a positive ID for camphor tree. Yes. The uh, the bay trees also kind of have a smell, but not quite, you know, as much different than um, a camphor leaf. Mm -hmm. so. so I had a lot to say about these. <laughs> <laughs> they're uh, they're also allelopathic, so they you know inhibit the growth of other plants around them. Uh, they take over the forest floor once it starts dropping its seeds, and the birds love the berries, so they grow everywhere. They're also evergreen; they don't stop growing, and they get huge. Um, the leaves you can tell they're alternate on the stems. Um, you won't find the nodes coming apart at the same time; they're always in different spots on the stem. Mm -hmm. um, and the leaf shape can be from oval to elliptical and pointed, and sometimes the point can have a bit of a curve. Um, they have, uh, I don't know the terminology exactly here for the, the veins. They're very, you know, obvious veins there. Um, yeah. And then what is it that uh, uh, you would call that for the down on the, the right side picture down there? Mm -hmm. You see the veins yeah. there? Is What's the terminology for that? Uh, they would just say prominent donation. So the, the, the okay. Base, the base, the <laughs> okay. Well, I'm learning, learning here to too. Recognize. <laughs> yeah. I love, I love the fact uh, that so we posted have a, a picture of the front. Uh, which part are you talking about? The veins, the, the way that the veins shape in the leaf. Oh, the way the veins are shaped. Hmm. Yeah, I don't know. We can look it up if you want. Would you like to do that? I guess Mark, Mark, you're on mute. Oh, am I? No, I hear you. All right. I'm, oh. I'm... Hmm. This is true. <laughs> yeah, I don't hear Mark at all. So, yeah, I believe they're called arcuate. So they all form an arcuate. arc. Okay. Yeah. Well, then that's an uh, interesting, you know, tidbit to add into this. <laughs> mm -hmm. I think the easiest way to spot 
um, cinnamon camphora is by just picking the leaf and crushing it. Mm -hmm. But if you are a arborist, uh, you get pretty adept at looking at trunks, even the, uh, the shape, color, the uh, structure, the bark, um, those are very indicative of tree species. They're unique to tree species. So mm -hmm. I'm so happy to see that you posted a picture of the trunk itself. It is a fast growing tree. Mm -hmm. Our prunus species can never compare to uh, the girth of a trunk and how, how uh, robust the tree really is once mature. So, mm -hmm. yeah. And the bark is very uh, different from the laurels and the bays that we have here. So I, that's why I wanted to add that is it's a very obvious feature once you look at it. Um, and then also the leaves are very glossy on the top is another thing to look at is like red bays aren't very glossy, but camphor mm. is pretty glossy looking. Mm. Agreed. And then we have uh, fountain grass, uh, Sancris cetaceus. Did I say that right one? Yeah. Okay, awesome. Uh, so that one uh, comes from Africa, Middle East, and uh, Southwest Asia and India. It is a category one, uh, but it's not uh, on the federal prohibited list. But I did notice, which I added in the note there, is that there were like four or five other plants that were of the same genus uh, mm -hmm. that are listed federally. So I thought that was interesting because uh, fountain grass is sold very commonly in landscapes. My mother-in-law has it in her front yard with some dune sunflower. And uh, it was a Florida friendly landscape, they said. So wow. it's interesting. <laughs> yeah. So, it's very common. And then I thought it uh, uh, interesting that the map there only has it for a few counties when I see it in Volusia County. Yeah. Uh, I see so. it escaping in Lake County a lot. Yeah. And uh, it's funny, like, it, you know, where I see them the most is when they're just initially escaping down restaurant back alleys or mm -hmm. behind uh, business uh, complexes. So whenever they have those uh, landscape treatments using fountain grass on medians or up front by the main entrance just to pretty things up, you see this escaping into where the gutter spout is or mm. between cracks of the concrete. And then it happens to be everywhere where it was not originally planted. Mm -hmm. Yep, I think I have a, a picture in the next, uh, next two slides over is where it shows in the concrete. So here's the, uh, the, okay, uh, the copycat there on the right is that's our fountain grass there. And I wanted to make the ugliest picture for it there as possible. <laughs> um, <laughs> and then in the middle, we have everybody's beloved muley grass. You know, it's so pretty, flowy, feathery. It has, you know, a similar look to it. So mm -hmm. sometimes because uh, fountain grass has some purple varieties, mm -hmm. it can sometimes be a little mixy. Um, mm -hmm. And then... Era Grostis Eliotti. Mm -hmm. uh, did I say that one right? You got it close enough. Okay. Um, that's Elliot's Lovegrass, purple, purple Lovegrass. Um, mm -hmm. And it's really feathery also. And since uh, fountain grass is so uh, variant, I wanted to add, you know, two different colored fluffy grasses there to mm -hmm. show. But those are our natives on the left there, and they're good guys. Yeah, they're good. And Aragostris is behaves more like an annual or a short-lived perennial. So after a while, mm -hmm. if if they don't sell seed, they'll disappear. Um, mm -hmm. I, I don't think Sancris or fountain grass does that. I think it's a perennial. It's a, yeah, it's so a it, very it successful coming. seeder. So it seeds mm -hmm. quite well. Oh, so I guess uh, the picture that I had initially there didn't, I had some issues with trying to add pictures. My computer was being all slow and everything. So I have different pictures than I initially had. So I wanted to add here, as you can see, the, the feather-like kind of yeah. uh, flower is what it is. Or I think those are the seeds, actually. Mm -hmm. um, it's very fluffy and soft. And so people love running their hands through it. They think, oh, this is so nice. I see it everywhere. It must be native. Or it looks like these others. But... So I added different colors here too because it's so variant in um, 
the mm-hmm. foliage too. Yeah. Um, and typically they're about three to four feet tall, although I've seen them get a bit bigger um, when they're just never trimmed back and they just keep going. Mm-hmm. Uh, and their narrow leaves uh, kind of curve as they grow outward and down. And uh, it's linear, so you see the, uh, the strong straight lines along with the leaf as it goes. Um, the flowers appear on stalks that come up about the same height as the leaves and uh, fall over in the same droopy kind of uh, form to kind of flow. And they range in color from white, pink, red, purple. You know, they're all over. There's so many cultivars. Yeah. Um, and the flowers are about 12 inches long usually. Um, and it's a year-round grower. just keeps coming. Yeah. I agree. Yeah, it's, it, I call this uh, the inflorescence almost like a plume. And, yes, and that's it's a good one. Like a like an animal's tail. So when we compare it to muley grass, it's more of a feathered approach rather than this compact tail like inflorescence. Mm-hmm. Um, it's an easy way in case people are unaccustomed or still you know new transplants to Florida and they. They are not accustomed to seeing muley grass or love grass, and they, they wonder if, if it's the same thing as a senchris right here. Yeah, it's a telltale sign is the, the inflorescence. It's pretty compact, mm-hmm. and it's almost like an animal's tail, like a fox's tail. Yeah. So, yeah, thank you, Kaylee, for your presentation. And, guys, if you have these, uh, especially uh, Praxilis, which is a uh, – Category two, Flepsy plant. Uh, I'm sure they would love to hear from you if you have camphor tree, but camphor tree is so uh, found pretty much everywhere in Central Florida. But if you see Praxilis uh, somewhere, or if you see Argyratum uh, that Kaylee just covered, uh, go to the website, or if you have the app, report it. I've got one. Uh, it's a great method for early detection and uh, addressing things quickly before they get out of hand. So I've got one.org or 188, I've got one. All right, so it's my turn. And uh, I just covered, I think, three plants. Uh, The one that I really wanted to cover was Ludwigia peruviana. And this one is, as you can see from the distribution map, it's found everywhere, virtually everywhere. I would... uh, account that I'm pretty sure you, you'll you find it vouchered in citrus and the rest of the handful of counties in the panhandle. So it's very successful. It's a statewide noxious weed adaptable in many different habitats. Many of our Ludwigia species, I believe we have uh, close to uh, over 30 vouchered Ludwigia species just here in Florida, also known as primrose willows. Uh, and the majority of them are native. Uh, the reason why Ludwigia peruviana happens to be particularly problematic in Florida is because it demonstrates great adaption uh, to many areas. They grow in dense thickets uh, in roadside ditches. You can find them uh, these days alongside uh, other noxious plants like Brazilian pepper. Um, they sucker. In other words, they are rhizomatous. They uh, send underground uh, suckering uh, vegetative plants that will reproduce, I'm sorry, which will grow and become separate plants over time. Uh, you know, and they produce large amounts of seed. Each plant is capable of producing tens of thousands of Bible seed. Um, you know, and additionally, when we try to hack this plant and we inadvertently leave over some of its trimmings, you know, off to the side of the road. Don't ever do that with this plant because it does have the capability of vegetatively growing into new plants. So they're very successful at uh, displacing native plant communities. Our Ludwigia species here in Florida are uh, wetland plants or facultative wetland plants, meaning they can, uh, you know, tolerate some uh, drier conditions in parts of the year. But Ludwigia, because it has, we'll go over this, It's a rather robust plant, as you can see in this picture right here. At the very bottom, you see like a small icon of a human being and a mature Mm -hmm. plant. So it can grow up to be 8 to 10 feet tall easily once mature. So it's a rather statuous plant. Um, But here it is with some of our natives. So Ludwigia arcuata and Ludwigia alternifolia. 
when we go to field trips, usually when they say, oh, when it's a four-petaled flower Ludwigia, chances are you're looking at Ludwigia peruviana. And that may be the case 99% of the time, but also keep in mind that that is not the rule. There are four-petaled native Ludwigias uh, here in Florida as well. So they are part of the four-petal group or the five to six-petal group. Um, the defining cate characteristics is that it's tall. So chances are if it's tall and woody, it's it, the probabilities are that you're looking, if it's growing in a ditch, <laughs> mm -hmm. it's, it's, it's Ludwigia peruviana. Uh, fuzzy leaves, at least when young, rough to the touch. Matter of fact, fuzzy leaves are the reason why this plant has a distinct advantage it knows how to tolerate drier conditions and escape out of the wetlands into other types of habitat like forest edges, ditches, uh, canals, um, and provides, you know, it chokes out other plants, it chokes out the, uh, the water system as well, it slows it down. It has four petals always. Um, and then while I was researching this, there are always conflicting reports. So guys, whenever you're researching it, always go to a reputable educational institution. In this case, IFAS gave me the best uh, advice on this and it said more than five stamens. So here are your stamens on the bottom right corner. So more than five stamens, they can have up to 10 stamens and they are cylindrical fruit capsules. So if you're looking at the plant, and if you see, okay, this plant has five, uh, four petals. Okay, we are looking at a Ludwigia, potentially Peruviana. But then if you're looking at the fruit capsules and they're cylindrical and they're wide, they almost look like wide vases. And I've circled them in red. That's a positive ID for Ludwigia Peruviana. And they also have this uh, exaggerated leaf venation, which you see on the other uh, underside of the leaves. But if you're looking for an ID, the wide cylindrical fruit capsules that are forming here in this picture on the bottom is a great um, ID and a positive ID for Ludwigia peruviana, besides the fact that it's growing in a ditch. Um, a great resource that I found was through IFAS, and I'm just going to pull it up briefly. It's a rather long presentation, but it has this wonderful key, and this is all for our um, you know, 25 plus odd species of Ludwigia that are found in Florida. So if you want to key out our native species to find out which one you have, this is a great uh, publication and you can simply Google IFAS Ludwigia guide and it should pop right up in one of your top search uh, results. The next one I want to talk about is Passiflora ciliata. So this was known uh, not too long ago as Passiflora fetida. So it was uh, thought that when you crush the leaves, it has a very stinking, unappealing odor. So Passiflora fetida was what we thought we had. And then I found one in my yard and I, I of course, crushed the leaf <laughs> and took the chance and wanted to smell it. And it didn't have a smell to it at all. So Passiflora fetida is actually not found in Florida. It is Passiflora ciliata, and that's the change that, that was made on the University of South Florida's herbarium. Now, in case you are citing this out at IFAS, it's a little bit behind, but they will catch up, but they're still listing this plant as Passiflora fetida. So the key for Passiflora fetida is that it has these really fuzzy multi-branch bracts and you can see them in the bottom two pictures. Matter of fact, you can see them in the top right picture right behind the flower as well. Um, but that's actually a positive idea that you are having uh, Passiflora ciliata growing. It is not on the FLEPSI list, but it does show high invasive risk per UF IFAS assessment. So. This is an emerging problem. Um, so here we have our common passiflora. So we're always uh, you know, familiar with passiflora incarnata here in central and north Florida. Great, robust, uh, suckering vine that uh, probably prefers large open spaces where uh, it can grow and thrive um, in large areas. Passiflora palins, which is not really found here in central Florida, but is found in southern florida matter of fact southern florida has 
many native pretty species of passiflora vines, uh, more so the, uh, than in central and north Florida. And then we have passiflora ciliata. So that's your copycat right here. And the defining characteristics of uh, passiflora ciliata is that the leaves are smooth except around the margins. And that's where it gets the ciliato uh, species name is that it's ciliate. And ciliate means basically tiny finger-like projections. And this is an excellent picture taken by Alan Frank at the U USF Herbarium. Um, but it shows these really tiny finger-like pro uh, projections that give it an ID for Passiflora ciliata here in Florida. And then it also has these floral bracts. And bracts are essentially modified leaves that help the flower in some uh, shape or form. A popular or famous example of a bract is one that you'll find on a bougainvillea. So all the red flowers are the beautiful uh, orange or white coloration of petals that you're seeing are actually bracts. And they are kind of helping the flower in displaying it a little bit better for to make it more attractive or make it more visible to pollinators. In this case, uh, you're looking at thread-like glandular segments. So when they're saying glandular segments, it almost indicates to me that there's some sort of nectar action going on with the uh, bracts. So, and the purpose of the bracts is that they're so finely branched is to help trap pollinator insects so that they hang around the plant a little bit more and they help it pollinate or they just stick around and you know do their uh, pollination services a little longer so here you have it and those are the three bracts and that's a positive id for uh, passiflora ciliata uh, the next one i wanted to touch base on is ruelia simplex so this probably is uh, one that is talked about frequently at the Florida Native Gardening Group. Um, it is a category one. And unfortunately, you will find this being used uh, a lot in, uh, you know, garden stores. Um, you know, this plant has a very tenacious and impressive strategy for tolerance and reproduction. So not only do they produce suckers that are rhizomatous, uh, so, you know, they'll send little uh, runners underground and they'll, uh, and, you know, it'll pop up as a new plant, but it also produces flowers with many viable seeds. Um, the next bad strategy and successful strategy, if you're looking at it from a plant's perspective, is that it tolerates full sun as well as full shade. Um, so it can thrive equally in both scenarios. It also tolerates a variety of soils with different levels of moisture. So in shade conditions, uh, Mexican petunia produces what we call cleistogamous flowers. So cleistogamous means cleisto meaning hidden and gamous meaning marriage. So like monogamy, polygamy, cleisto, hidden marriage. So cleistogamy means that it does produce a flower, but the flower never blooms. It stays shut and the uh, flower self-fertilizes itself. So it can produce seed without ever opening. So this is an interesting characteristic and a very tenacious stat strategy for uh, Ruelia simplex, also known as Mexican petunia. Its or origin is in Mexico. It's a, a category one, uh, and it is tall. So that's one of the easiest defining characteristics of Ruelia. So here we have our more diminutive or comparatively shorter varieties or uh, more uh, less robust looking varieties for lack of a better word, Ruelia succulenta, which happens to be endemic to South Florida. And we have Ruelia carolianensis, which is uh, very uh, popular and well-known in the native gardening community, found in many native gardening uh, nurseries. Uh, and then we have Ruelia simplex, which is your copycat and it's non-native and it's a category one invasive. Another way to really ID Ruelia is its nodes. The nodes are the part of the stem where branches or leaves are coming off of. So that's your node and it has a prominent swelling right at the node. It does not necessarily have to be red. Matter of fact, we found Ruelia growing in large swaths in shaded wetland conditions and this plant will not be red at all it'll be more palish green so 
don't let the red stem fool you into a uh, improper ID or a misidentification. It's always tall. It's up to one meter, which is a little over three feet, um, except for a few cultivars. So there are some cultivars out there in play. They don't necessarily have to be purple. They can be white. They can be pink. Um, but, uh, but, you know, comes in many colors. But Ruellia simplex, naughty. Always look at the nodal swelling. That is a positive ID for Ruellia simplex. So if you've got one, report it. I've got one.org. I'm going to hand it over to Jennifer. Hello. All right. So I did my um, research a little bit differently. Um, I wanted to figure out what it is that you need to look for when identifying plants that are not flowering, because a lot of times people rely on the but that's sometimes a short time, a relatively short time during the year. Um, and the main things to pay attention to are the leaves, the petiole, which is where the leaf is growing out of the stem, and then the stem of the plant. So things to look for with the leaves and the stems and the petiole are the size, shape, the margins or edges of the leaf, how that's shaped, the leaf arrangement, how many per node. So the node is that little bumpy part of the stem where the leaves are growing out of or a branch stem is growing out of. And um, the thickness of the leaf, texture, is it fuzzy? Is the stem fuzzy? Uh, is it shiny or matte? So those are um, the different types of attributes to pay attention to. Um, next slide. So the first one we're doing is, all right, my turn to butcher. Brucinetia papi rifera. <laughs> and that's the paper mulberry. And the reason I chose that one, um, we have one growing on the road, down the road from me. And my daughter swore it was beautyberry. And I was telling her that it's not beautyberry, it's the paper mulberry. But I couldn't really explain why. It's just like, it's the shape of the leaf. That's all I could explain. So so it was it was interesting to go through this exercise to be able to say why. Uh, so it looks like this is a category two. Um, I would say it's more invasive than that, but but maybe there's reasons for that. And it says um, open invader of fields and forest edges. And um, it can reproduce through suckering, through rhizomes, and dioecious. So go to the, um, I wanted to point out um, on that image, if you look at the leaf, um, right where the base of the leaf is, you can see the lobe and the base of the leaf. It has um, the two lobes like a heart. So that's something to pay attention and if you look at the edges, there's um, they're serrated right close to where the lobe, right where the lobes start arching. So that's the one identifier that really helps. And the leaf has got a lot of texture to it. And you won't see that with the beauty berry. All right, now go to the next slide. So this one, uh, when paper mulberry is young, its leaves resemble beauty berry. So on the left side, we have Calicarpa americana, which is the beauty berry. And if you notice right at the base, um, it's, it's straight lines. And it does have some texture to it, but it's, it's less than the um, paper mulberry. And it also has serrated edges, but they're not as sharp. Um, and at the tip of the leaf, it's um, pointed, but it's kind of blunt, so it's not like a super pointy tip. The leaf side, the leaf size is um, half width is length. So that's another um, aspect to pay attention to when identifying plants. And then on 
uh, the paper mulberry on the other side, you can see how it has the heart shape leaf and the um, beauty berry does not have the heart shape leaf. Can I go to the next? And here I'm showing, um, so Cali Carpa Americana, when I research plants, I like to look up the etymology on it. So um, the Cali part is beautiful and Carpa is fruit. Um, I also noticed that Carpo has to do with the wrist. So I guess there's some kind of confusion about that. And when I first read that, I thought it was because of the location of the berries or the fruit, which is right against the stem. And um, so you can see, you might be able to see in the picture that the petiole and the stem have fine fuzz. And you can note on the picture, the lack of serrated margins at the base. Uh, most of the year, there's some kind of reproductive visual indicator on Beauty Berry. Um, it, it goes dormant during winter and then the leaves come out and that's the only time really where it won't have fruit or flower and it'll just be the leaves. Then you'll have these green fruit, uh, you'll have the light pink flower, then the green fruit, and then it'll turn the beautiful purple color. And um, the leaf arrangement, when you look at the nodes, you'll see there's two leaves growing out of each node. And um, they're opposite to each other, but then if you look down the stem, um, it's, 137.5 degrees, which um, you'll notice in a lot of plants, they grow in this and it's the, I think it's pronounced by PHI. It, it's, it's, um, it's based off of efficiency. So the sun shining down on the leaves and every time it grows a new set of leaves, they don't wanna block out the sun. And there's also different types of um, nutrients that they use up to grow that way. So it just, it just ends up working out the most efficient way for them to grow in that pattern. And now to the next one. So um, I found that drawing the pictures helped a great deal when um, learning about the plant, getting to know the plant. So I, when I started drawing it, I got into great detail and then I wanted to label it. And in order to label it, you have to find out what all the parts mean. And um, also while you're drawing it, you can really notice every little detail, the veins and the serration and the position of the leaves, things like that. So it's a really helpful tool when learning about a plant. Next. And here's some more drawings I did of the uh, beauty berry. And I was really paying attention to the base of the leaf on this drawing, just to emphasize how it's straight right at the petiole. Um, and on the other side, let's see. Oh, I was paying attention to the um, serrated edges here and um, there's inflorescence at the leaf's axles. So there's a lot of little uh, pieces of anatomy on the plant that I learned about here. And what's really interesting about the, um, the, the leaf's nodes, they're kind of like stem cells, so the plant responds in different ways depending on um, depending on what's happening with the outer world. So, um, if everything goes right with this plant, it grows a leaf, and then it grows the, the flowers and the. Um, but if if something happens, like if it falls over on the ground, um, and enough leaf litter or something 
covers it, it would grow roots and sprout up a new plant because of the um, the special cells that are in a leaf um, in the nodes. Right, and go to the next. All right, so this is the copycat. So this is an image of the um, the paper mulberry, and I did a side by side with the um, the beauty berry just to show, like it's similar, but you can see all the differences. So if you combine like the heart shaped leaf, the textures of the leaf, and um, the leaf arrangement, where there's two on the node on the beauty berry and one for each node on the um, on the paper mulberry, uh, that's the best way to notify notice it right away that you either have beauty berry or paper mulberry yeah i love that i love that you look at the leaf shape i would have never thought of it because yeah we're because we are such plant enthusiasts we can just look at a plant and say no that's not beauty berry but yeah yeah you Please. took a further step and you really showed and demonstrated by drawing also that just by looking at just one single leaf, we can tell that it's not beauty bearing. Yeah, and that's just it. It's like, you know it's not, but why? That's why it, it helps to just do a little research on a plant that you already know. Yeah, I love it. And one thing about the paper mulberry, once it's mature, once it's too late, basically, <laughs> It probably has already reproduced all over the place. Um, the leaves become more lobed. But as you're di driving down the road, you'll notice big paper mulberry trees and the, the leaves are already being lobed, like the ones that are circled. And on this image, I, uh, the arrows are pointing to the fact that um, there's one leaf growing per node. Yeah, rather than two for beauty bearing. Yeah. So uh, one leaf. Oh, you're going. Okay. So the next one. That's fine. Um, so this is my archenemy. It's growing in my yard everywhere, and I've been digging them up for forever. And, yeah. And, I'm, and it's it's not even close to over. Yeah. <laughs> so this is Dolly Chandra Anglis Katy. It's a cool name. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I guess it's common name, cat's claw vine is cool too. Um, and this is a category one. Mm -hmm. And in this image here, it's totally covering a tree and that's exactly what they do. They cover a tree and smother it and then the tree dies. Mm -hmm. And the image on the right here is, I lined one up on my arm to show um, the claws on it, they are very defined three claw, um, three claws, because the one I'm comparing it to does not have a defined three claw claw. Yeah. <laughs> Tendril. I think it's tendrils. I'm not yeah. even used to Well, it's actually a modified leaflet. Yeah. It's a leaflet? Okay. Yeah. Crazy, right? It is because they're all kind of growing out of the same spot. Like if you look at where it's growing from the stem, there's leaves growing out of it. And then there's this mm -hmm. claw of it, and there's all kinds of stuff going on right there in that part of the plant. And so at the, um, at the Florida Native Plant Society uh, um, plant sale in mm -hmm. Sanford, I bought the um, crossvine, the Bignania capriolata. Mm -hmm. And I'm not familiar with that one at all. I, and so I planted it in the space where I've been removing cat's claw vine. Mm -hmm. And so when I was going to do this whole project here, um, there was, I was taking pictures of it and, and I noticed that it had these claws and then there's another plant coming out and I wasn't sure if it was the cross vine or the cat's claw vine. So it was, it was very difficult to tell at first and now I can spot it right away. 
Yeah. So, um, so with the, oh, go back to the other one. So with the um, crossvine, you can see the claws are not really um, defined uh, three prongs. Yeah. They're kind of just, they have some kind of sticky adhesive to stick it to the mm -hmm. uh, tree. And um, the cat's claw vine actually has like little tiny claws. They're not super sharp where they'll cut you, but you, you can tell it, it'll it cling on the skin. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, and then the leaves are really similar, but um, go to the next one. So in here, it this is the cross vine and the leaves are opposite with two basal leaflets. The arrow's pointing to these little tiny leaflets and the cat's claw does not have that. So that's one great way to tell right away if it's cat's, cat's claw or cross vine. Mm -hmm. um, from the axle grows a, a petiole and from that petiole grows the paired leaf and the terminal leaflet is modified in the branch tendrils that have an adhesive disc to attach the surfaces. Um, and when you look at these leaves, you can see like the little bumps uh, are the lobes that grow mm -hmm. at the base. And that's another thing that cat's claw vine doesn't have. Also, these leaves are thicker and more stiff than cat's claw vine. Yeah. And Jennifer, I don't know if you saw this, but your picture here shows a tendril also. So it doesn't have yeah. those. Yeah, it's like uh, branching. Yeah. So it's not that classic three prong or trident type uh, yeah. hook or hooks. Yep, definitely not a cat claw. All yeah, right, and more images. Um, yeah, I was pointing out um, one of the things I noticed when I'm looking at this plant growing is if it doesn't attach to anything and it's just kind of um, wavering in the air, mm -hmm. at some point the plant gives up on making those claws and they just dry up and it keeps going. <laughs> Interesting. And, um, so note the lobes at the base of the leaf, tendrils not distinctively forked with three prongs and they're also not sharp. All right, uh, next one. Um, so here's the Dali Chandra Angulis caddy, the mm -hmm. cat's claw vine. And this is a really young one that was growing out right next to the cross vine. So mm -hmm. this is the one, I, what is that? And I could see, okay, it has the three prongs because you can't really tell anything with those little baby leaves. But mm -hmm. the claws are definitely cat's claws. And uh, on the other picture, um, oh, you can see how the leaves are thinner and there's no um, lobes at all on that. So it doesn't have those little bumps where the base mm -hmm. of the And you can't tell with a picture, but it's, it's a more delicate leaf. It's thinner. Mm -hmm. than I see. I see you've been gardening over here with. <laughs> uh, I'm picking up the cat's claw vine. <laughs> That's <laughs> awesome. I should have took a picture of the poop tuber. Oh yeah, uh, those are infamous. Yeah, they are. And here's another one. This is the one that was growing right by it before I pulled it up, and you can see how the leaf can vary. Mm -hmm. There's some that are really wide. Yeah. And then usually you'll see them where there are more long, classic leaf shape. Mm -hmm. Yeah, those are those are the earliest leaves oh, yeah. and they do. And that was another thing. So I have it growing actually in my backyard, like as a ground cover. They will. So it had covered this orange tree. I don't know if it killed the orange tree or if the orange tree died from a disease, but it grew all over the orange tree and the orange tree died. Mm -hmm. So um, I burned the dead orange tree mm -hmm. and it was too late. The cat's claw vine has already grown all over the yard. I've been mowing it, assuming that it would die one day, but it never did. Yeah. 
Yeah, there, so, are no, there are no biological controls for this vine, only herbicide treatments, unfortunately. Yeah. So it when it grows along the ground at all the leaf, um, it'll develop little creepers that go into the ground and continue on its track all over the place. Yeah. So not a fun plant to have. All right, so drawing helps you see the details and notice the anatomy. So if you draw photos and diagram the different parts and learn the name of the anatomy, define the names when they're in Latin um, and learn the etymology, it helps you remember, um, remember all of these. So these are just my own personal notes when I was learning about this. Absolutely, you did a wonderful job. I wish I was uh, that gifted in sketching, but this looks awesome. You know, um, I don't think I'm gifted. I think it's just, um, you know, you just keep doing it. You just keep mm -hmm. doing it. I, I think I improved just doing this. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, and this was um, some more sketching of the cross vine. Um, so that's when I really noticed the little, um, the leaflets and the way the the plants were growing. They grow opposite, but it's like, it has two opposite stems and then the stems branch into the opposite leaves. So mm -hmm. there's a little better pattern than what you're used to seeing on a plant. Correct, correct. It's crazy, but that claw is actually a modified leaf. And it just is a testament to how complex plants can be because they've been around for a long, long time. So they've had plenty of time to evolve and specialize and create these unusual characteristics. So thank you, Jennifer. Yeah, if you have cat claw vine, visit I've got one.org. Easiest way to differentiate cat claw vine is by that trident claw. You know, that's a positive ID that you have cat claw vine. They'll always tell you to go find the mother plant because usually when there is uh, a cat claw uh, bed in your lawn, you need to go find where the mother plant is because those are all the seeds that have germinated into your lawn. Keep making seeds. Yeah. Thousands every year. And thousands upon thousands. Yeah. And they are wind dispersed, so they fly far and wide. So you may not necessarily have one in your immediate neighborhood. It may be one neighborhood over, but yeah, go find the mother plant and get rid of it. And that will help with the uh, success of your eradication. So anyways, I'd like to pass it on to Jia. Jia, would you like to talk about Chinese wisteria? Sorry, I've got a really bad delay on my computer, so um, you have to bear with me. But yeah, so I um, I wanted to start with this one because as a kid, this was, um, I had a neighbor who had this in her yard as a child, and I thought it was the most beautiful thing I had ever seen. And um, as an adult learning about native plants, I found out that a lot of some of my favorite plants <laughs> ended up being horrible. Um, so actually I'm going to talk about a couple of them, but so this is Chinese wisteria, um, it, you know, origin, um, when I was researching, um, I saw the origin listed as both Japan and China and it is listed as a category two, um, invasive exotic. Um, some of the interesting things that I, I found out about this plant is it can live for a very long time. It can get very, very large. I, I didn't realize how large they can get, but um, individual plants have been seen to live for upwards of 50 years. And um, basically the, the reason it's such a problem is, you know, they are so, so long lived and they get so huge. They will pretty much smother whatever comes in their path. They will climb up large mature trees and then they will um, shade them out. Um, so they'll block the light for the tree and everything else below it. And, you know, they've, they've been shown to take out mature trees. Um, so, so this one is definitely not a great thing to plant, even though it's kind of a, a neat, <laughs> a neat plant, but uh, 
yeah, we can move on to the next. So um, there is a native wisteria, American wisteria, which as an adult, I was very happy to learn. Um, they can be found at native nurseries um, fairly commonly. I was able to purchase one. And um, you can kind of see the differences a lot in the flower. Um, that's why I wanted to put the, just the flower clusters side by side because the, the leaves can kind of look similar and be confusing. But the flower cluster for American Mysteria is very um, dense, kind of compact. And you see how they're all very close together. And with the Chinese wisteria, they tend to be um, sometimes, not always, but like more spaced, more spaced apart, as you see in the other photo, that they kind of, and they're much longer also. Um, so that's another way of kind of telling them apart. And so I really liked the, um, the herbarium, um, photos from the the plant atlas the florida plant atlas because it really shows very well um you know what the leaves look like what the flowers look like so i wanted to use these photos to help compare um but basically i think one of the easiest ways to tell these apart is really just looking at the flower just from a novice standpoint um the way that the flowers are kind of longer and spaced out whereas the um, American Wisteria is more of a, a dense cluster of flowers. Seems to be probably the easiest way that I've noticed. And um, the, the flowers for Chinese Wisteria can be, I think it was upwards of like 40 centimeters. Oh yeah, 40 centimeters. Um, and then for the American Wisteria, it was probably, I think it was like up to 25 to 30, if I'm not mistaken, seven years. So that was what I found out for this one. Oh, this was another heartbreak of mine. Um, as, as a kid, one of my favorite things was taking the little flowers and sticking them inside of each other and making a little chain. And I would make little bracelets as a kid. So it had, it was just like nostalgia for me. And um, there's, there's a lot of controversy that goes on in, in the gardening community with this one because a lot of gardeners argue that butterflies love it. Um, they don't want to take it out of their yard because they feel it has too many benefits. But this, this is a pretty bad plant. Um, I mean, a lot of people mistake it for native because when you look along roadsides, you see it you know, um, taking over areas and roadsides, you see large four or five foot bushes that just, you know, with mounds of flowers and, you know, and, and that's, it's, it's not a good thing. Um, this plant, um, it is category one invasive. Um, and it does, one of the things that makes it kind of dangerous is that not only does it, you know, of course, crowd out native plants, but it also has the ability to hybridize with one of our um, very rare endangered um, endemic lantanas, lantana depressa. So, and the danger with that is you can cause extinction, extinction by basically contaminating the gene pool. So that's, it, it's dangerous to have that around wherever lantana depressa is because, you know, they hybridize so easily. So the um, the comparisons here, um, I wanted to show um, there, there are two native lantanas. There are more than two native lantanas, but there are two that are commonly available at native nurseries. So if you really like lantana and you want a replacement, um, the one that I would recommend um, more than anything would be the lantana and Valuprata button sage, because this one, does not, has not been shown to hybridize with the invasive lantana, and whereas the pineland lantana does. So um, Roger Hammer actually wrote a really great article about this called The Lantana Mess. And anyone who wants to learn more about um, kind of telling the, the uh, pineland lantana, um, tell that apart from any of the various 
hybrids and cultivars that are on the market um, because there are issues with a lot of nurseries selling just a yellow um, lantana as lantana depressa when it's actually not. So um, he explains very well in his, in his paper um, how to kind of tell the differences and where all the confusion comes from. So it's, it's a great thing to look into. And I've actually seen him, you know, say that he wouldn't really suggest that people grow pine and lantana because of the danger of it hybridizing. So um, I'm kind of with him on that. <laughs> um, the um, this slide right here, the, um, I wanted to show, um, because one of the questions people have a lot is how to tell the difference between the lantana depressa and um, any of its like hybrids or anything, you know, if they want to know if what they have is actually what they think it is. Um, one of the differences to tell between the depressa and lantana stratocamera is the shape of the leaf. So you can see um, where the leaf meets the stem, it is very broad and kind of flat. Um, whereas in, with the um, lantana depressa, um, and I kind of enlarged the picture of it, kind of over in the top right corner, that kind of shows where it doesn't have that broad leaf base. It's kind of more of, it's, it's narrow and kind of tapers, yeah. So um, much different shape, but that's not an end all be all to tell the difference, but that could be a way to tell. Like if, you're, if you think you have lantana depressa and if it has like the broad base on it, it's probably um, a, a hybrid. It could have been tainted somewhere down the line. Um, it's even been sold in native nurseries that way, unfortunately, because sometimes people mistake it, it happens. Um, but that's just one thing to look out for, okay? But overall, it's very difficult to tell the difference sometimes. So I would, I would absolutely read the article by Roger Hammer. Um, and if you're super concerned about it, it probably needs to be tested genetically <laughs> um, in order to really tell the difference if, if, between those. So, there's Liam Pepper. This one is um, taking over my yard currently. Mm -hmm. um, I hate this for the fiery passion. And <laughs> it, is, it is not my friend. Um, I live in Volusia County and pretty much all over um, all the roadsides of by 46. It's just lined with them. Um, I mean, in some areas it outnumbers any other plant along the roadside. And um, the reason that it spreads so well is for a few reasons, it's kind of adaptable. It's mainly, it mainly lives in kind of more moist areas, but it can be adaptable to some other areas also. Um, and birds love the berries. It, it produces a massive amount of bright red berries that birds just go gaga for. And then of course they, you know, spread that everywhere um, in their poo, you know, <laughs> and uh, it's just, it's, it's awful. Um, not only is it a category one, but it's it's the the worst of the worst. It's um, it's it's uh, it is on the Florida prohibited plant list. You cannot purposely propagate this, or purposely grow it, or sell it, or it's um, it's a bad guy. No. Yeah, it's horrible in South Florida. Yeah, I think it's bad pretty much everywhere except for I think it's maybe not as much in North Florida, but um, anywhere. But it's it's pretty bad in a lot of places. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, and the one reason I wanted to compare it to Dinwiddie Holly. So, Dinwiddie Holly is one of our native hollies, and we have a few different native hollies. Um, but I chose this one because it's pretty widespread, and um, I have that in my yard personally, and I love it. So. Um, a lot of people kind of mistake the two, and I don't think that the common name, so there's a common name circulating sometimes for Brazilian pepper called Florida Holly. And um, so if you hear Florida Holly and somebody points to that, it's not Holly and it's not from Florida, um, but to whom Holly is. And um, the, the difference is really, um, to whom Holly doesn't have large clusters of of berries like the Brazilian pepper does. Brazilian pepper you'll often see with very, you know, 
just just completely covered with with clusters of, of berries. Um, June and holly, they're a little bit more sparse and kind of scattered around. Um, and the leaves are totally different. So that's very helpful in determining um, the difference between like maybe a native holly and Brazilian pepper. So, and um, here I kind of show the difference between the um, kind of the leaf shape um, with Brazilian pepper as opposed to Zoo and Holly. So the, um, the leaves are alternate and compound and you see where, you know, you have the stem that comes out and there's maybe, what is it? One, two, three, four, five, six, maybe seven leaves. Um, that kind of come out from this main stem, right? Whereas Dune and Holly, you see that you'll have like, you know, one leaf that kind of comes out, all right? So that's that's like the biggest indicator with just the way that the leaves look. Um, they both kind of have toothed margins, but I mean, with, with um, Holly, it's more like, um, not really serrated, it's more like a sharp tooth. And with Dune Holly, it doesn't, it's not super prominent like some other hollies. You might not even see it, but if you run your finger along it, um, kind of like backwards towards the stem, you might feel like a little sharp little pinch. So a lot of the hollies have like the little sharp teeth on them. And Dune Holly does, but it's just not as prominent as some other hollies. Um, also with Brazilian pepper, um, when you crush the leaves, that's once you get familiar with what it smells like, it's got a very pungent kind of peppery smell. Um, I would caution people with that, though, because some people are very allergic to the sap in Brazilian pepper. It is in the same family as poison ivy and poison oak and poison sumac, I think. So um, some people are very allergic to it. Um, my son is one of those people. I can handle it fine. I can actually crush the leaves. I could do whatever, and it doesn't bother me. Um, my son uh, swells up completely. His lips and his throat start to swell. So it's not a good situation. Um, and because of the toxicity of it, in order to get rid of it, you also don't want to burn it because the fumes from smoke can, can be bad also. All right, so this one, um, this one comes up a lot, I, I think in gardening groups um, for ID requests. And it came up in our group um, one conversation in particular, I remember, I think it was about a year ago. And um, this one uh, is, is invasive, it's a category one. It goes by the common name Christmas Senna. Um, I'm assuming, I think, because it blooms in late fall to early winter. So um, it is a category one. Um, it is often um, mistaken, and, and I think that one of the ideas it was given, one of the ideas it was given um, initially was Cassia biocapsularis, which isn't, to my knowledge, um, an invasive plant here in Florida. So the, the bad thing about this is if nurseries are selling it as that, but it's actually this invasive Christmas in it, that's, that's a bad situation. And there's a couple ways to tell the difference. So um, and I'm gonna kind of go over that too, even though Cassia bicapsularis is not native, um, I kind of want to explain the differences between that and the Christmas Senna as well as um, some of the native ones too. Okay, so we have a few native species. We have the Privet Senna and Bahama Senna. Um, Privet Senna has these very long, thin, um, kind of lancelot leaves that are kind of pointy at the, at the tip. And it's a really cool looking plant. This is native, it's much more widespread than Bahamasena. Bahamasena is actually an endangered um, plant here in Florida and it's found in South Florida. It's, all, it's like it's a little bit more dry conditions than the Privetsena is, but both of these are commonly found in native nurseries. Um, the Christmas Christmasena, um, one thing that you'll notice about this, if you can see in the picture, is that the leaves are very round. They're very like oval looking. The, the tips of them are just like pretty much completely rounded. Whereas with the Bahamasena, the leaves are a little bit more round, but they still come to a point at the end. Um, the Privet Senna, much longer with that point in the end. So that's like a real easy way to kind of tell it apart. Um, 
the Christmas Senna and the Senna by Capsularis also they both do have round um, they both do have round leaves also. But one way to tell those two apart is the seed pods on the Christmas Senna are kind of thicker and more like kind of like little green beans. <laughs> the on the on the two native species, the seed pods um, are long, but they're flat. And um, the Christmas Senna, it's long, but it's kind of more cylindrical. It looks a little bit more kind of like a green bean to me. And then on the other native species, which I didn't include photos of because I didn't really have space for it, but just for reference, um, the one that is commonly sold and you know mislabeled, um, the bicapsularis, it, the seed pods are flat but much wider. So it has the same round leaves, but the seed pods are flat and wide as opposed to looking kind of like a green bean. Okay. Um, Okay, so this and this really shows the the huge difference in the leaves. I think that's really the easiest way to tell the difference um, between this invasive species and our native species is that you know our our you know Pomacassia and Privetsena come to a pretty defined point, and this invasive one um, is very very rounded on the tip. So the flowers may look almost identical, you know, if you're just looking at them casually, and it could be easy to mistake it, and they grow to similar sizes but that leaf is going to give it away immediately. Ah, super sword fern. Okay. So this one's actually in my yard also. Um, so this one is a category one also. Um, it does spread very very aggressively through rhizomes and these these little tubers that you see are more so like kind of like water storage for the for the fern um i don't know if it has any kind of reproductive purpose but it, it's it doesn't not from what i've been reading but it more spreads from the rhizomes that are underneath and um it's it is the only sort that we have a few sword ferns in Florida, but it's the only one in Florida that you can find that has this little round marble sized tubers. So if you dig up in the ground and you find that, then you can pretty much positively identify that it's the the, the invasive tuber sword fern. So, and some of the sword ferns can be very difficult to tell apart just by looking at it. So if you're not digging underground and you're just looking at it, um, there is kind of a way to tell, there's a few ways to tell, but um, just from the average gardener, just looking at these photos or if you were out, I mean, it might be very, very difficult. So on the next slide, I'll kind of explain a little bit um, how you can tell them apart. Okay, so one of the things that I, I was reading was that with the tuber sword fern, um, the, the little leaflets, that are coming off the side. And I did put like these little red markings right next to it to kind of show you. I enlarged the um, the fronds to kind of show. But with the tuber sword fern, the little leaflet kind of is more blunt. It's more rounded on the end um, in general. So, you know, I've seen it kind of vary a little bit, but for the most part, the, the invasive sword fern will be a little bit more blunt, a little bit more rounded on the end. Our native um, wild Boston fern comes to more of a point. So you can kind of see that through these pictures, the difference. So like I said, I have seen variations, but in general, this this could give you an idea if you're just looking at it and you don't feel like digging in the ground to try and find some tubers. <laughs> but if you can dig and try and see if you can find some of those tubers, that's probably the most fail safe way to identify it. For the novice anyway. All right, I think we're. I at think the that end. was all the slides that I had, if I'm not mistaken. <laughs> yes, yes, it was. Thank you. That was great, guys. Uh, we covered so much, and honestly, there are so many more copycats that we could cover too. Perhaps we should do this, uh, you know, another time, maybe in round two mm -hmm. or an episode two 
on copies cat invasives i want to thank everybody for joining us um if you can please uh donate to couplet fern our venmo cash app paypal information's there you can always send us a check via p.o box uh, again we're celebrating our 10-year anniversary this year this is our 10-year uh milestone watershed moment uh, servicing our community in our region if you happen to be in our region please uh, go to fnps.org we'd love to have you as a member and that could be your way of also showing your love and support for the florida native plant society as well as our mission which is the conservation preservation and restoration of native plants and native plant communities i want to thank Gia, Kaylee, Jennifer, for taking so much time out of their busy schedules. They are family ladies. They, they hold down the fort in their respective homes. And for them to put together such a beautiful, well-informed presentation, not only for Couplet Fern, but also for the Native Gardening Group and so many other uh, audiences across YouTube and Facebook. I just want to thank you again so much for your hard work. Thank you. Thank you for your um, well, help guys, and support. Thank you so too. much, and we'll uh, have some right, anytime. Happy to help. Bye, guys. Bye for now. Thanks. Bye.